um, yeah. <laughs> Um, well, first of all, just say a big thanks for giving us a paper and giving us a briefing like this. It's incredibly helpful, and I like the process, so thank you. Um, so, look, my first question I've indicated to you is just what's really being done for pedestrians as a result of consultation, because I just don't feel we've got it right yet, and until we get our cycle network up and the law change, it's problematic. The other thing is, too, I spoke to Beam, and they said, oh, no, geofencing, it's old tech. Now you have to take a photo and show it before you end your ride and then um, then to prove that you've parked properly. I've seen some pretty dodgy parking though. Um, okay, so it might be helpful if I run through the changes that we're proposing to the Code of Practice around accessibility. Uh, so for deployment of the scooters, you know, when they're put out first thing in the morning, uh, the footpath is going to need to be 1.8 metres uh, in width. Width is not in our current Code of Practice. That's in line with it. 1.8 clear, so that's in line with the Trading Public Places bylaw. Uh, we're reducing the CBD response time for um, urgent non-compliant parking from two hours to 90 minutes in the CBD, uh, where a lot of the scooters spend most of their time. We're requiring larger text for the ID numbers so that they're uh, more visible. Uh, again, they, the, to what you've just talked about, we're requiring that they do a t an audit of 10% of the end of ride photos to uh, check uh, compliance, we are requiring that 92% of those end of road photos must be compliant, otherwise we will be having conversations. Um, if, it's th if a scooter's sitting there, for, uh, currently the code of practice says if it's there for three days unused, it needs to be shifted, we're reducing that down to 24 hours. Uh, we will continue, uh, so that the actual definition of urgent in incident has been expanded and you would have seen that in the document that we provided that had all the changes that we're doing to the code of practice. We will continue to advocate for uh, scooters to be allowed in cycle lanes. Um, now we know that a lot of them do currently ride in cycle lanes and it's not likely that the police are going to enforce that, but we would like to be able to put up signage telling them that that's where we expect um, e-scooters to be. And at the moment we can't do that. Uh, we will work with providers that, as technology improves. Um, it is our expectation that geofencing will continue to be used and we will expect uh, further, more stringent reporting on that. But yes, the end of trip photos is a new requirement that we're adding in. Uh, in terms of our reporting requirements, we are going to require quarterly, and these are all changes, these are all different from what was in the past. We are going to be requiring quarterly reporting on geofencing compliance and improvements that they expect to see in geofencing compliance um, over the next quarter. Um, and, yeah, so that, that's, I think, quite a few significant changes that we're making to the Code of Practice. And we're always open to other suggestions as well, obviously. I'm sorry, can I also just ask, are they allowed on the Golden Mile? No. So there's part... There's well, they're, they're allowed to ride on the road in the Golden Mile, okay. but they can't be um, shared or... they can't. The ride can't start or stop in the areas where we've geofenced. But there's scooter parking in Courtney Place, as an example, on Cuba Mall? There's no scooter parking in Cuba Mall. No. Okay. Um, and I guess, look, just so, should we just be saying, no, they can't go on the footpaths, they have to go on the road, and then we slow the speeds down? Well, I mean, this is this is the interesting safety issue, is you, you have confident riders and you have non-confident riders. We don't want to be putting non-confident riders in the road with general traffic. Uh, you'll see, for example, I, I live in the central city and on Torrey Street, e-scooters are pretty much always on the road because it's a relatively low traffic zone because of the number of cars. So ski, I've, I've never seen a scooter on the footpath in Torrey Street. I'm sure that it happens, but you see them in the road. So there's no one rule that we could come up with that would cater in terms of safety for all users. We could... Um, um, slow them down everywhere, but then they will always be on the footpath. They will not be on the road. So you'll have scooters on, you'll have, they'll be slower, but they'll definitely be on the footpath because they're not going to feel safe being in the road with general traffic. Whereas if we allow them to go faster, yes, it's not a great thing when they go fast on the footpath, but they're more likely to go into general traffic. Um, thanks very much for this. Um, the, the main issue I have with a lot of these um, new rules that are bring in is that they're not enforced and they're, they're not followed up. Now, I've had a bit of a thing about these e-scooters since um, a friend of mine was actually knocked over by one in Taranaki Street and reported that. Now, one of the rules about the scooters now is that after a, um, a rental was there, or actually after a hire has finished, they have half an hour to come and take the scooter away or to park it in a, um, a better place. Now, when I was walking to work this morning, just along, and this is just this morning, so outside the Westpac bank there, there's a scooter there that's sitting there across the footpath. Now, they're fighting the space on the footpath with the people that are sleeping there. So it's, 
you know, they're not actually doing what they already meant to be doing. So how can we actually enforce them to do other things? Like, and I find them, they're all over the place. I had a scooter, two scooters up in Broad Meadows. Mm -hmm. I saw them the night before when I went home, and so they were they're still there the next day. So... So when when so uh, so we ha yeah we yeah, have no, to mm. understand it. So we, we have response times right across the city. So if you if you have a complaint, then there's a period of time around non-compliant parking. There's a period of time which the scooter companies must respond. More generally, without a shared e-scooter scheme, we have no control over scooters at all. Um, they're not deemed a private motor vehicle by Waka Kotahi, and they reconfirmed that decision in November last year. So actually, when we first introduced the e -share, the shared e-scooter schemes, it was to try and get a modicum of, of control over what was a new and emerging technology. And my Mobility is something that um, cities all around the world are now dealing with in terms of it's not your traditional bus, car, bike, pedestrian anymore. So through the code of practice that we have, we issue a trading in public places um, licence. That gives us the ability to put in place a code of practice that if they want one of those licences that we can hold them accountable towards. So we actually get a level of control over scooters that we wouldn't have if we didn't have these schemes there. And like I said, we're, we're making... Um, the code of practice more robust when it comes to accessibility. In terms of enforcement, uh, you're right in terms of riding on footpaths and that we've had people who cycle on footpaths and they're not meant to, but that's not going to be a high priority for police to enforce unless it's a real danger. We do have the ability through this, uh, if we have to go and remove an e-scooter because the company hasn't done it, then there's a $371 um, fee that we will charge them. That's a pretty good incentive to go and do it yourself because if we're getting a lot of these, then that's going to add up over time. Um, if that's not working, then we can start to uh, reduce the number of e-scooters that we allow them to have, so reduce their cap. And then if it's really bad, we can take their licence off them. What I can tell you is that we have not had to get anywhere near that with any of the scooter companies that we've operated with uh, since this was introduced in 2018. They've been very responsive. Uh, so I think that in terms of enforcement, through this EDGE shared e-scooter scheme, we have a level of control that you will never have if we just have private e-scooters in Wellington. We have no control over that. Yeah, thank you very much for this. It's great to see some of those accessibility improvements and what is... Yeah, an environment where you don't actually have that much control. So it's good to see some of that. Um, I had a couple of, I guess, sets of questions. Um, one of the ones was around the change in the unique identification number, and that was going to 100 points, and it was removing the 30-point... 0800 number. So I was just wondering, in terms of the other requirements for operators, was there anything that was sustained around mm -hmm. the way that a person on the street would report that scooter, and how would they access that information to know how to report it? So I think the change, and Tim can correct me if I'm wrong, I think the change in the code of practice was to reflect the actual practice, which is there wasn't an 0800 number, but there was a unique identifier. Um, but we want to make that unique identifier better. Uh, where a scooter is parked, obviously the unique identifier is very easy. Uh, where it's going past you, I mean, I've, I've, I've had experience with these scooters where it's gone past me and I have seen the number so I have been able to report it but at the same time if you can give the time and location of where something happened then because they, they, there's a GPS on all of them they can usually find out so the unique identifier is probably belts and braces Yeah, so I guess um, for the general public is it that they're contacting the council about them are they contacting the provider or both? Or So it, it varies um, in a... It all, eventually they all go to the provider but they come through different channels Yeah, so... The, um Sorry. So the um, complaints come through our Fixed app or um, through Fresh Service, which is our call centre team, and they are directly forwarded on to the operators to deal with. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, and then the other one that I had was around the Courtney Place precinct, and I noticed that it's already closed on some periods and we're just shifting the Sunday for the Thursday. Um, but I guess my question was sort of around if we're shifting the end of trips outside of that zone, what amenities were available on the edge of that zone, just to make sure that the public space at the edge of the zone, I guess, isn't then taking a larger area's end trips in a smaller but physical space. I don't think space. we've seen, we've had any issues arise as a result of that that we've made okay. aware of. It's something to keep an eye on. Um, but generally it, it was more just that we're sending a message that if people are out in town drinking, they're not going to be using e-scooters on a Thursday, Friday or Saturday night. Yep, 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 cool. I'm happy to go back on the list. Actually, I'll give myself a question. Uh, uh, I'm a, you know, I don't like the idea that we're going to impose financial burdens on the scooter companies because I think that ensuring that they are affordable will ensure that they are used as opposed to private scooters, which I think is a highly desirable situation in terms of our ability to regulate uh, and ensure that the scooter's speeds are controlled and geofencing and all the rest of it. So I'm a bit worried about the increase in charges mm -hmm. um, and 
I was just wondering if, it, if rather than uh, a sort of, you know, we think our costs are going to rise by whatever it is, 60 percent, and therefore we've, we're effectively uh, seeking a 60 percent revenue increase from the scooter companies, that we could have something which was more retrospective. So in other words, keep the charges at the 11 cents, I think, which is the current uh, charge, and then have a sort of a wash up at the end of a period, which would uh, basically force us to be more accountable for our costs. I mean, because I mean, the part I'm worried about is that we're a, we're a monopolist here. Mm. Um, and as a monopolist, I could always see that it becomes easy to justify higher costs. And I, but I would rather we actually justify them retrospectively than prospectively because it just causes us a, a, a reason to increase our charges. And I'm just wondering what you think about the idea of getting the two companies to agree that we would go with the 11, stick with the 11 cents as a starting position, but have an ability to actually charge up to 15 at the, at the end of a year if it turned out that our costs were higher than whatever the 11 cents actually generated by way of revenue? Uh, I mean, we'll certainly take a look. We can take a look at that. Um, the 15 cents brings us into line with other councils, so that was one of the reasons. But also, there, there's a... There's <laughs> No comment. Um, there's also a, a particular report that we rely on for a lot of our data that we're currently getting for free that might become quite expensive. So that was that was the reason that we had projected that we might have increased costs. We expect that we're going to be need, need to pay for it. But we can take a look at that between now and the committee meeting. Sarah, you're next. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, I was just going to ask about the um, levy that we put on each scooter and from memory it was a few dollars, and that was meant to be going towards providing um, parking or, or providing other infrastructure to help manage some of these issues. How's that going? Yeah, uh, so um, the money that we get from the, the revenue for school companies goes towards staff time, which is time-sheeted. Um, some of the installations that we've done for the drop zones for the scooters, education programs, uh, et cetera. Um, but we, would, we were looking as part of our... Um, the accessibility improvements we're looking to do more on street uh, parking, which would also be paid for by this. Mm. And the other um, thing that I, I wonder is, um, you know, obviously we would think there was climate change benefit here, but I think some of the German research has shown that it's it's smallish, it's there, but it's quite small, and it can be undone if there's a lot of extra running around to collect the scooters, particularly on small vehicles rather than a van. So do we have any information on, on how they're managing the, um, you know, relocations and collecting them up whenever they have to? Uh, so they, when the batteries are changed out, they're actually using some of their own vehicles. So they're using electric scooters or electric bikes. Um, they use electric vans as well. So that's mitigated through that. Okay. So do they um, tend to... Um, bring the batteries to the bikes rather than take the bikes to a central yes. place. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, okay. Seeing, yeah, that, that's uh, meant to be the better way to do it. Yeah, just you'll see the paper. people with the vests yeah. on and, and on the cargo yeah. bikes. Yeah. And my other question, if I could have one more, it's just a following up on a matter raised by Ellen Blake from Living Streets. Has there been any, um, do we know of any, um, you know, bans for people who've left scooters poorly parked or any sanctions at all for people who've left scooters poorly parked? Yes. Do we yes. have any feedback about that? Yes, we do. It's probably a question that you can ask the scooter companies when they come to public participation. Yes, okay. We, uh, yes, we do have that yeah. information. We're just not sure whether they'd be comfortable with us sharing it in this forum. We didn't have time to check. Okay, okay. Came. Yeah. But they, they I do, think it would they, be they good do. to know. But that there are that they are taking action is what I can say. Yeah, because every time I see one poorly parked, I must admit I kind of harden my resolve on this matter. But yeah, no, it'd be good to ask them. Thank when you. When I see them poorly parked, I shift them as well. Well, I, they're hard to shift, and they beep at you. I've tried that. Yeah. yeah. I just want to be clear. I'm not anti joy. I know that some people enjoy them. Um, are they safe? You know, just in terms of the stability for people who are using them? It feels like a very existential question. <laughs> no, I just mean that, you know, whether this little platform is, is, is stable enough to make sure that, you know, people... Because there have been some horror crashes, obviously. Yeah, no, they have, and there have been on private e-scooters as well. I mean, they... Because of our code of practice, they will look to... Um, to use the technology that's going to help them best meet the code of practice, which has a lot of, which is very strong on safety. 
So, I mean, I can't speak to each individual type of e-scooter that they have out there, but again, a question for them next week, I think. Okay. Um, now, Ellen's raised a large number of points. Are you, so are you able to go back to her in writing and just CC councillors? Is that... Uh, yeah, I mean, I prefer to answer as many of them here okay, as possible. Right. Yeah, just because it's. Well, so, so we're going to get quite a lot of written Q and A, and I'd like to. Yeah. Use okay. This okay. So, um, so the first. Sorry, maybe just three. Point, otherwise, we will be here all day. Um, yeah. So first of all, we because I met with Ellen last night. Uh, Two point five million trips sounds like quite a lot, but what isn't that in the context of um, the walking and cycling and bus trips? So the the reason that we compared it to bus trips is we have really good data for bus trips. We don't for the others. Except so, for census data, right? So we walking. didn't want to, to provide a comparison that wasn't really going to be particularly helpful. So it's 4% of bus trips. Yep. So it's quite a small number then. Yep, but then we only allow a relatively small number of scooters, and okay. we do that for very good reasons. Okay. Um, this point about that they actually, I mean, they're not really, I get they're quick and efficient, but they're not really doing much for your fitness as opposed to walking. Sure. Do you accept that they are replacing walking trips? Yeah, and we say that in the paper. that they're, Well, no, we don't know for sure. Right. Because we also know that a lot of people use them for fun, so there's, they, they probably wouldn't do that as a walking thing necessarily. No, um, they're doing wheelies. But we do, we do say in the paper that there is a risk that this is replacing walking trips, so we've been upfront about that. Okay. <laughs> Well, they can do what they like. <laughs> Ray's favourite restaurant. Um, and the code of practice, so um, I think Living Streets has asked for some more input into that, some more consultation. Yep. Are we able to action that request? So, look, next week you're going to make a decision about whether or not this goes ahead. Um, and if it does, then, yes, we will be open to having those conversations, but they need to be in the context of an instruction that you will have given us to proceed rather than an instruction that they might want them to... Rather than coming from a point of view that they might just want them to stop. So, yes, we, we are absolutely open to talking to groups about how we can make our code of practice better, but we want to do it from a position of understanding that if you've given us an instruction that we're going away to allow e-scooters and e-bikes, that we will have e-scooters and e-bikes. Right, OK. So I think that's just the point that they feel that there could be more done in, and that, we're more, in we're that code of practice. We're happy to do that, yeah. And And as long as maybe we can say... Look, I'm oh, sorry, it was, I read it quickly last night. That's I need fine. to read it properly. The um, Whether we can sort of say, look, this is an interim solution until we get our cycle network standing up and there's a law change, because eventually they should not be on the, f the footpath, as mine. Eventually we, we would like to be able to direct them into bike lanes, yes. Yeah, yeah, OK. Um, all right, let's, maybe some other people can have a go, because that's a very long list of questions. Thank you. Kia ora, thank you. Um, just a parte, I've done a few harbour cleanups and we end up with a, f a few hundred e-scooters and e-bikes when we do these schemes. How has that conversation progressed around uh, maybe geotagging and recognising or putting the onus on the on e-scooters the e and bikes themselves to pull them from the harbour? In terms of them pulling them from the... I mean, they, they've got every incentive to, to mm. not have them left in places where people are going to come by and be idiots and chuck them into the harbour because they're not cheap. Mm. Um, I don't think we've had any conversations with them about requiring them to salvage them from the harbour. Mm. Has there been any conversations about making the management of that a little bit easier? And I know the batteries can be quite a hazard as well in terms of a relationship with Southern Landfill about how we, we treat the batteries or how we treat the scooters after they've become defunct. So as, as part of the process that we go through with the tender, what we ask for from companies is to give us their plan for how they're going to deal with recycling um, and dealing with the, the, um, the batteries, et cetera, et cetera. So we, again, that's probably a question for the scooter companies about, about what their plans are. Yeah. Um, thanks. As much as I like um, Tim's um, suggestion about fining oil, mm. I, I actually... I'd actually welcome any revenue that we actually get into council, so I think that's good. But but I think the objective is actually to improve their behaviour, to so improve or maybe improve their their policing of of where their scooters are. So, is there would it be an idea to say like every time I see them, I, I ring up the scooter company? But is it better then if I ring up the council? so that we've got a record of, of all these complaints, we've got a record of how many times that people actually ring, so should we be encouraging people to do that instead of ringing the, the scooter company? I, I think if you want something to happen quickly, it's better to go straight to the scooter company, and they provide us with, um, with monthly data on all the complaints that they get. Mm -hmm. um, and we have no reason to not trust that data. 
<laughs> yep, okay. Is there any technological way we can actually track where these um, scooters are being um, sort of left in, in dangerous places like you know, in, in the bushes or um, anywhere? Is, can we actually track that or, or does the scooter company we, do that? We, so, so yeah, we can. It would probably take quite a lot of staff resource and I'm not sure it would be the highest priority given that we would put that onus back on the scooter companies actually to do that rather than city council staff. Um, like I said, we, we've tried to do things like reduce the response rate, particularly within the CBD, so that they have to respond to complaints uh, a lot more quickly. We've now put in, in, in place a performance measure for doing that, beyond which we would have conversations with them. And, and I have to, I don't, we, as I said, they've been very, very good to deal with, so I wouldn't foresee that we'd need to move into removing the number of scooters off the road by way of kind of a bit of a, bit of a stick. Mm -hmm. um, and they've got the end of trip photos, and we'll be requiring a 10% audit every month with 92% compliance. So I think we're going to be taking a big step up in terms of our ability to enforce from the current situation. Mm. Uh, and I would, I guess, my, my what I would say to councillors is let's see how that goes, because mm. I think it, it is good changes, and I think, councillor, it's, it's, it's addressing some of the issues you're raising, mm. but the proof's in the pudding, right? So we need to see how it goes. Yep, okay, great. And thanks. The last question is that we don't allow scooters on, on Lampner Key, on the footpath in Lampner Key, do we? No. Okay, so do we have other areas that we don't allow them in? Like, I get a lot of complaints about people in Oriental Bay, because Oriental Bay, there's a huge number of people walking along the along the parade there, and so they're intimidated by the scooters sort of going and weaving in and out. So is there, are there other areas where we don't allow them? Like, would it be a good idea to consider that? Uh, there are. So it's Golden Mile, it's Cuba Mall, it's Parliament. Uh, and, Oriental. and Oriental Parade. Oh, okay. it is. So, 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 so there's a couple, couple of ways that we do. So so we do allow scooters to be used in, in the Golden Mile. So mm -hmm. they can be driven along the road and they can be ridden along the footpath of, of Lambton Quay. They oh. just can't be locked on, on the Golden Mile. So you can't end your hire there. You've got to go into one of the side roads to end your hire. Uh, it's the same with Oriental Parade. Um, you know, you can be ridden, but we we have geofenced the speed of Oriental Parade, yeah. so they they can be used there, but they, they use slower. The machine itself slows down in Oriental Bay. So, and so, just, so on the Lambton Key footpath, it's because we can't geofence accurately. Oh. Um, so that's I say as a geofencing technology, like we don't want them on the footpath, and all the mm. messaging is you should not be on the, riding on the footpath. Um, but the geofencing technology isn't accurate enough for us to differentiate between the road corridor and the footpath. So the oh, best thing that we can do at the moment is say you can't start a hire or end a hire there, um, but they shouldn't be there, but at the moment we can't stop them. I'm not and sure. again, because yeah. of the, the way they're classified by Waikato, we don't have yeah. enforcement powers. So I'm not sure how that, how that works then, because if they can't end a hire in Lambton Quay, then how come I saw this scooter outside Westpac this morning? And that's something we will look into with the yeah. scooter company, because that shouldn't be happening. And you're right, and it occasionally be seen. Yeah. Great, thank you. Yeah, my um, final question was just in the paper, it recommends giving um, an extra 200 scooters and 100 to each company, and that's based on the increase in demand that the providers are seeing. Were we seeing equal demand increasing for both providers? For e-scooters? That might be commercially True, that might yeah, be commercially okay. sensitive. Perhaps, perhaps, I can, perhaps I can jump in there. So the recommendation here is that we, we don't just renew the licences for the existing two, we go out to the market. So okay. we might end up with two new providers okay. uh, that have a completely different offering, um, and that's in our tender evaluation. So we, we need to select the best two for Wellington and all the offerings we get. Um, I remember when we first went out six years ago, I think we ended up with about eight offerings to, to operate a system here in Wellington. Um, it's... Clearly, it's quite commercially attractive for the providers. Um, they're, they're quite a big investment in Wellington to roll out the, the number of scooters and bikes they've got. Um, I guess overall, we're reasonably happy with the existing two, so there's no necessarily reason to go away from them, but we might find a better provider that uh, has a better offering, What how they offer for accessibility, sustainability. Um, all of that will be part of their evaluation criteria. So don't assume that we've got the, current, the, the same two will be out there in the future. It might be might be one or both, uh, or completely new. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Iona. So does that mean that we could slow the scooters down everywhere, not just Oriental Parade? Yes, but it comes back to my point that I made earlier, which is if you slow them all down, they will all be on the footpath if they're not confident to be in the road. So like how, how fast are they then on Oriental Parade at the I moment? I think it's 15. 15. 15. 15. So, so they could go... what? 
So what speed can they go on the footpaths then at the moment? Any speed? So, so if it's ungoverned... So you correct me, guys. If it's ungoverned, how fast do they go? It's as, it's really as fast. <laughs> Down, downhill, they go faster, clearly. Uh, I struggle to get them to go uphill very fast. Um, but I think it's sort of that 25, 30 kilometres an hour. Is you could, and a push bike, again, they, they are also governed, but you can ride faster than what the governor. Yeah, so it's... Okay, so sorry, I'm getting a bit confused. So they can, they can go on the footpath at Lambton Quay or the Golden Mile, but they can't stop or start the trip there. Yeah, that's okay. So I think that's where there's some of the issue. Um, I I did talk to Beam also on their smaller bikes, which I thought were really good. Um, but the, one of the concerns is that, that that means they can now ride on the footpaths because they've got smaller wheels. Is that no, correct? So, no, it's not correct. Their wheels are 50.8. 50, 50 Centimetres. Oh, okay. So yeah. they're still they're still quite large. And I think just the last question now. I might just need to take some more offline later. But um, just one about regulation that Ellen had. You know, is there is there anyone actually? I mean, how many people are being um, snapped for not following the rules? Um, so in terms of the scooter companies enforcing um, bad behaviour, like I said, you need to ask them next week. We do have those figures, and they are actively um, well, taking action wherever they do get complaints. Uh, in terms of Enforcement, like I said, they're not private motor vehicles, so we really don't have any powers of enforcement. Um, there's no infringements available for use under the Trading Public Places by law. Um, so I think what we put in place in the Code of Practice in terms of the $371, if we have to go out and move a scooter because they're not, is probably a significant financial penalty if we ended up with a company that was particularly dragging the tra chain on acting on the lower response times, etc. cetera. Um, but... We think we, we're using all the powers that we have. The reality is, as, as long as they're classified as they are, we really don't have enforcement powers. Yeah. And, and we've got the added thing that they're not allowed in bike lanes. Mm. Yeah, that was just the point I wanted to clarify. So so because they weren't classified as motor vehicles, which was, that was the decision last year, wasn't it all? Yeah. yeah, that was problematic. We can only use the trading in public places by law. So there are no other regulatory tools because Alan seems to think that there are more. Um, well, look, we're happy to talk to Alan if she's able to point us. But in, in the time we had between getting the email last night and, and this morning, we couldn't find anything. Okay. Uh, Sarah? Yeah, thanks. Um, look, there's not a lot in the paper about, well, it doesn't appear to be, I haven't read it thoroughly, but about um, e-bikes. So are they, uh, how's that going? Uh, yep, so that, there's, there's probably less in the paper about e-bikes because they haven't been in operation uh, for yeah. as long and we have uh, fewer of them. Um, but there's quite a bit of information in the first attachment, um, which is the, the review report. Um, no, they're, they're going well. We're seeing longer trips than are being taken with scooters, so we'd like to think that those are commuter trips, we can't guarantee it, but you'd, you'd think so if you look at the heat map that we've provided of where all the trips are taken and the length of them. Um, at this stage, we, because um, you'll remember when you, you agreed that we could add e-bikes into the e-scooter regime, um, we started with 50 each and then they could go up to 150 each based on demand. So um, one of the companies got up to 150, Beam, I think. A flamingo, I always get it around the wrong way. Uh, flamingos up at, uh, got up to 150, Beam still at 100. Uh, we didn't think there was any um, reason to increase the cap for e-bikes right now, but um, it's, it's servicing a different market, which seems, which seems good to have that variety. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, because I, and, I have, and I'll confess I haven't read through the whole paper, but um, in terms of the decision you're making today, what's hap is this similar to the sort of decisions that have been made in, in other cities, or ha are there other, other um, councils that have sort of pulled back more for, from, from the micro mobility? Uh, we haven't seen... So internationally, you're seeing um, some quite big cities pull back from e-scooters in particular, but no, not in New Zealand. And in fact, what we've done with the code of practice here is we have aligned it. Um, so it's now very much aligned with Auckland's code of practice, but um, we're not aware of anywhere in New Zealand that's pulling back. No, and the cities that internationally pull back, they do allow them to be used in cycle lanes. Yep. So they're still existing, but they're not allowed on the footpath. But they're in the cycle lands. Yeah, but probably different different regulatory regimes, yeah. I guess, and, 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 and population pressure too, I sort of And the only thing I'd add, and just because I saw you tone it, it reminded me, and I forgot to put it in the paper, is also to remember that we have scooters deployed in Tawa, um, and that's kind of loosely linked to the Porirua City Council shared scheme, but it comes under the Wellington City cap. 
So the number of scooters in Wellington City hasn't increased. They've had to remove them from other parts of the city to allow them in Tawa. But any decision that you make also potentially has an impact on, on Porirua City scheme. OK. Um, second question, in terms of the recommendation to retender, um, I was wanting to understand to say when you retend it, it's going to be for what sort of period, and and is there a and is is it expected to be an open retender at the end of that period as well? So I'm just wondering, and that, that's sort of like the, we're at the end of, the, of a tender, which was which is four years, is it? Three years. Three years, and, and we're going so for another three years. And so we're looking at doing another three years, and and then and then another decision, and and then we'll do the pro process again. Yep. Okay, and, and economically that works out all right. I mean, you can ask the scooter companies that. I'm sure they'd love longer. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, and so the third question is and something that uh, Alan Blake has also raised around this is sort of a light e-bikes that have uh, smaller wheelbases and according to the regulations that the smaller wheelbase bikes are allowed to on sidewalks. And I was wondering what the position you have on on supporting the use of bikes that are legally allowed on the sidewalk versus um, whether or not you could you should say um, you can you can have them but don't put them don't tell people they can go on the sidewalk or do you say you know what, what, what's that position because I just think there's an, you know obviously there's pressure from the scooters the last thing we want is larger e, e vehicles going on the sidewalk yeah look, I, I guess government um, wanted to allow toys and, and children to, to ride on the footpath. Um, felt that it was safer for, for children to be there and not on the carriageway. And the, the governing thing there is the size of the wheel. So it's determined that a small wheel is a toy and a toy could be ridden on the footpath. I don't think there's any expectation that we'd see bikes getting smaller and smaller wheels to the, then qualify to be able to ride on the footpath. And I think we need to be quite firm around that, that we don't want to see adults riding on footpaths, whether it's a, a scooter or a bike of any sort, it's just a way of getting around the legislation. Uh, I think our organisation ought to be consistent with our approach that you know, toys are good, but not adults on on transport. And and but the the smaller bikes that Beam have bought in, the wheel size is bigger than that. No, but they, there yep. is yep. a smaller version. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I mean, that's part of the thinking. But that's something that's we can good. manage with the scooter operators. Yes. Yep. Okay. Thank you. I've got a couple of questions. Uh, but while everyone else is thinking about the next one. So the first is is that, I mean, as you're aware, uh, we've had this uh, parking the, uh, process around the uh, hospital and a lot of debate about whether we're removing car parks in that area. And I'm curious as to whether we're seeing micro-mobility being used in respect of specific destinations. And I was thinking of the hospital, whether, because a number of the people who actually submitted about the, you know, the loss of curbside parking said that public transport wasn't any good and they couldn't get to the hospital at you know, their times of work. And, I, and does the data show that we are actually seeing people use micro-mobility to get to, to places like the hospital? I mean, the hospital is the specific one I'm thinking of, but are we seeing anything around that? Uh, railway station, definitely. Um, are we seeing any? Yeah. Yeah, the heat, heat maps show heat like. maps, I have a heat map, yeah. So, yeah, so we've got, we've got heat map. The heat map's in the report, isn't it? Yeah. So in the in the first appendix, or first attachment, we've got heat maps that kind of show, well, they don't kind of show, they do show, um, where the scooter trips are being taken. We know the railway station is a, is a very big destination, but we can check about the hospital. Which sort of leads on to my second question. Um, I, I do see uh, micromobility as an adjunct to public transport. Um, and I, you know, I mean, I... Do, but we don't actually sort of treat it as public transport, do we? But is there any reason why we couldn't? And part of the reason I can see there's a benefit out of that is that obviously the government has rules around subsidies. Uh, now, we're obviously, we don't subsidise uh, micromobility, even though uh, our fellow council uh, down the road does subsidise other forms of public transport. But I, I'm just curious as to why we can't actually treat this as a form of public transport. and and have it included in the public transport type figures, and also have it included, which might be a benefit to the regional council, of course, because now they're getting hit by the 50% FAR, uh, and this obviously would would help them uh, meet those targets. And I, so I just wonder if we could actually treat the use of uh, micro-mobility as a form of public transport and have it included in the data accordingly. Uh, we could go away and have a look at that. I'm not sure off the top of my head. I imagine there's probably elements of the definition around the number of people it carries 
that wouldn't work for micromobility, but we can go and check. I, I don't know off the top of my head. Does anyone know? Yeah, okay, we can go. We can go away and have a look. I just want to count, pick up a little bit more about your good, implied good idea around the hospital. The hospital was in the in the zone for e-scooters, isn't it? So if, if someone had to park um, further away due to the you know the the, the incoming restrictions, um, one option would be to uh, potentially have an area where there might be an e-scooter park, and they could park near there, but further out and, and grab an e-scooter, go into work, or, or and jump back out again because. You know, they are, um, for someone who's tired um, uh, and wanting to get somewhere reasonably quickly, um, they, they obviously have some convenience options. So I wasn't sure whether that was something to be explored as part of the Newtown side of things. Yeah. Just as an alternative to try and provide um, accessibility to those that are going to possibly lose out. When we when we first introduced um, the micro mobility shared micro mobility in Wellington six years ago, uh, we were sitting around this table uh, debating, and I think there was uh, was a four hour debate uh, around uh, around this table. That's <laughs> fine. Um, four hours uh, and 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 <laughs> obviously burned in your memory. And um, and and by committee, we developed the code of practice. And, and I say we because we got lots in there, including we received submissions around the, the hospital precinct and uh, the thought that there would be people on these new fangled e-scooters uh, whizzing past the, the hospital at speed. So our response to that was we limited their speed. So within Ridderford Street, and we can't limit it to the footpath, so Ridderford Street <laughs> is one where speed is limited. Uh, down to the 15 kilometres an hour. Uh, but I can't remember whether we geofenced the parking, and I, I think we did so that we, again, so we didn't see scooters being parked in front of the hospital and people tripping and falling over them uh, right at the, at the front door. Um, that is something by committee we could go, <laughs> go back and look at again, whether there's a, a, a zone, whether we could geofence a zone for the parking, so that it was quite a clear area where they were able to end their hire versus the, the footpaths in that area where they couldn't end their hire. So I'm um, happy to work with them around how that might work. But, yeah. Uh, so, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, it's, it's um, and, and we're seeing this sort of showing that in the Tawa on-demand bus service too, that it takes a remarkably long time for, for, for people to get an understanding of how a mode will be used. And I think you're sort of, we're probably coming up to the first time where it's been quite stable um, I, you know, you talk about accidents. I remember the very first generation of e-scooters with the battery on the stick were notoriously dangerous, mm. um, and obviously learned from that um, the hard way. In case of some people, um, yeah. So, so yeah. I just, I just, um, I'm, I'm, I'm equivocal about it because I think it's yet another mode that clusters up things, and if it's not going to be significant, then it's actually a problem. Um, and but we. I'm not sure. Um, it hasn't quite proven to be significant, but it's obviously pr works for a number of people. Yeah, it, 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 it does. And I think I come back to the, the point that if we don't have shared e-scooters, the mode doesn't disappear. Um, and it, this is the way that we can actually get a modicum of control over the majority of e-scooter use in the city. So I, I take your point. And also, we could probably get far greater climate change benefits if we allowed a lot more of them, um, potentially, but also we don't want it to dominate and as long as they're not classified, as long as we can't direct them into bike lanes, as, as long as they're, they're going to be on the footpath, if you've got non-confident riders, then we want to keep control over the number that we have. And we think, in hindsight, we struck the balance quite well between having enough of the scooter companies to, to, for it to be commercially viable and to attract a lot of tenders so that we get competition and we get people coming up with good ideas. I mean, they, all the scooter companies know that accessibility is going to be a massive issue and is going to be an important part of our tender process. So um, I think... In this way, we, we have far more control over this mode in our city than we would if we weren't issuing these licences. Just on that point about significance, how, did you say how many rides actually occur each year? Uh, yes, yeah, in the report that we've... It's about a half million. Yep. Well, that is significant. I mean... Two and a half million over two, two and a half years. Oh, OK, so it's like a million a year. Yep. Yeah, yeah well, I mean, and, and you've got to remember some of them are disturbingly short, you know, like... Yeah, but a lot one of people catch the bus from one end of court the place to the other. I mean, uh, yes, I understand that, but um, a lot of bus, 
It's shorter than most bus journeys. Thank you very much. That was very helpful. Thank you.